on this week's Rebel Report. The Vegas Golden Knights get closer to the Stanley Cup as they play in round two of the NHL playoffs, blowing out the Sharks in game one of the series. Are you ready? Go Knights, go! Give me a G, give me a O, let's go! The UNLV Palm Team holds a clinic. Do you think you have the skills to be a part of the Palm Team? They explain what you need to do to make the squad. The UNLV women's softball team takes on their rivals from Reno in a crucial Governor's Cup matchup. Also, there is a new addition to the UNLV football program. Meet the Rebels' new defensive coordinator. And our team makes a new friend while playing soccer. The Rebel Report starts now. Welcome to episode 9 of 10 of the Rebel Report this season. I'm Cecilia Heston. We're thrilled to have the men's coach, golf head coach, Dwayne Knight, joining us in the studio before his team competes in yet another NCAA tournament. And I'm Michaela Jackson. We're almost done with the semester, which means we're nearing the end of season 5. It's so crazy to think how fast time went by here on the show and out on the playing field. But we've had a blast covering the games and putting together stories just for you. I agree, especially in the world of professional hockey. The Vegas Golden Knights have taken a hold of the city as they continue to surprise, well, everyone, everyone. in the NHL playoffs. The Golden Knights are going shark hunting during the second round of the playoffs. And in game one, the defenders of the fortress feasted on shark meat. David Stepanian has the full story. When you hear the score 7-0, you probably think of a highly defensive football game. But if I told you that that's the score of an NHL playoff conference semifinal, what would you think? Well, that's exactly what happened here at T-Mobile Arena for Game 1, when the Golden Knights, and especially Marc-Andre Fleury, shut out the San Jose Sharks. Though most sportsbooks had the Golden Knights as favorites to win the Stanley Cup heading into Game 1 of Round 2 against the Sharks, they were still a very small favorite to win this series, but the team, and especially Marc-Andre Fleury, defied the odds once again for a dominant shutout against San Jose, Fleury's third in the past five games. Yeah, it was a little bit, a little bit the same thing, you know, we had the puck a lot, and like you said, we shot a lot of puck in that, and, uh, you know, we're lucky to get some, uh, some a lot of goals early, and, um, you know, it just gives a big uh, momentum boost to, to the team. The game was not without controversy, with the Sharks star player Evander Kane getting aggressive with a high stick to Belmar, which carried a five-minute major and two more goals for Vegas. The final score was 7-0, and the Golden Knights gave arguably the most dominant performance of any team in this postseason. James Neal at the side of the goal. That's seven. Yeah, I think it was just, I mean, it's the energy in the building. It's the energy that our team brings. I think it's a lot of things, so um, it's a fun place to play. It's, uh, it's loud. Uh, fans are into it. Uh, I love seeing goals. And, uh, you know, we had a few, so it was, uh, it was good. It was a good start. Um, so we'll put it behind us and move this game two. A 7 nothing win is a great win for us, but it's one game. And then we're in a playoff series, so it doesn't mean anything. It could be the 2-1 game win in overtime, so it doesn't mean a thing. So we just got to make sure we're ready to play the next game. And we know San Jose is a good hockey club. That's not going to happen again, 7 nothing. With game two coming up, Michaela, I'm not sure how Flurry can top this. Another shutout, more Krispy Kreme donuts for the fans. I guess we'll see. For the Rebel Report, I'm David Stepanian. As a reminder, Mayor Goodman has banned the color teal in Las Vegas during this series. On Saturday, April 28th, the Golden Knights played the San Jose Sharks at T-Mobile Arena for Game 2 of the playoffs. There was no one wearing till out of the, out of the 18,600 fans, which was a new attendance record for T-Mobile Arena, but there were a few Shark fans out there. But let's take a look at Game 2. Yeah, David, you had the win, and I had the loss. But my game was intense, went into double overtime, and there was controversy. And Jose, I thought, had a pretty good period, Lou, yourself? I thought so, too. Get this puck away, though. Here's Carlson, steps in, scores! 
Vegas took the early lead as William Carlson scored the first two goals of the game. After 140 minutes of not being scored on, Mark Andre Fleury gave up a goal. Just like that. Shortly after, the Sharks came back and scored three consecutive goals to take the lead for the first time in the series. Vegas went out the draw to see. In the third period, Nate Schmidt scored the third goal to tie the game. Then the crowd roared throughout T-Mobile Arena and defenseman Braden McNabb noticed the energy from the fans. Fans, this crowd is awesome. Uh, you know, they gave us a jolt of energy in the third for sure. They were, it was pretty crazy, really loud. So yeah, they were awesome and they've been awesome all year. So you know, it's kind of expected and you know, we're very fortunate to have them. The Golden Knights were in the penalty box for 22 minutes and head coach Gerard Gallant had a few words to say about that. Well, I wasn't too happy with a lot of it, to be honest with you. Uh, I think we had uh, one power play that when they flipped into the stands and they had seven, so I wasn't too happy. During overtime, there was a debatable call that could have lost the game for Vegas. Jonathan Marshall found the back of the net and the crowd cheered for the winning goal. But then the goal was challenged and overruled. The play is under review to determine if there was goaltender interference prior to the puck entering the net. This is what Marshall had to say about his almost game-winning goal. It was a hard game out there, and we tried to do the best decision possible on the moment. And, uh, I mean, uh, the way it is, we had the adversity tonight, and uh, we got to give credit to the other. The Sharks won the game in double overtime on a power play goal. Logan Couture wins it! It was not a terrible loss for the Golden Knights. Fans still got to see in overtime and watch Nate Schmidt score the tying goal. For the Rell Report, I'm Michaela Jackson. The Golden Knights headed to San Jose to play out the next two games. As of this time of this taping, the Golden Knights are tied 2-2 two two in the series. Now we go, oh, we go under Rebel Radar. The UNLV softball team is wrapping up its regular season and recently competed in a three-day tournament against UNR April 27th through the 29th. Brandon McGregory joins us in the studio to give us the full rundown on how the ladies are doing. Thanks, guys. The UNLV softball team returned from a three-day series against Boise State where they took home, with, home two wins earlier in April. And before playing UNR, the Rebels fell to 6 and, eight and 9 in the Mountain West Conference play, and we're hoping they would get their first sweep of the season. After one win secured against Reno, UNLV softball played them again, holding a lead of four to one runs by the sixth inning until Reno began to come back scoring five runs, giving them the lead. It wasn't until senior Janine Petmecki came clutch hitting a home run, which gave the Rebels the upper hand and the lead with a score of seven to six runs. I wasn't really having very quality at bats, so I was really excited when, when Mimo ran that out because that was that was just awesome on her. So I was like, make it a quality at bat. Like I was not thinking home run. The reason we get that two run homer is because one of our players run hard and she beats out an infield single. You know, so you know all the things that we've been talking about, culture, character, and those kind of things. It really is starting to show. Both teams were obviously not going out without a fight. You can catch UNLV softball as they take on the Fresno State Bulldogs May 4th. The Rebels were able to push back the Wolfpack days, days one and two, but did not finish the sweep the third day. UNR took home the final win of the tournament with a score of eight to one. The ladies are currently sixth in conference standing. The Mountain West Conference Tournament begins later this May. Back to the desk. With the UNLV softball team getting a series win against Reno, allowed them to pick three more points in the Governor Series. Rebel football is working on patching up the holes on the field. Not literal holes, but holes in the defense, with the help of a new defensive coordinator. Nishan Zaragoza introduces us to Tim Skipper. At the spring football practice, taking a look at the new defensive coordinator and how he influences the players, not only on the fields, but in life. Let's take a look. 
The Rebels welcome new defensive coordinator Tim Skipper to the lineup, who will not only tackle the new coaching position, but will also oversee the squad's linebackers. Skip, as they like to call him, takes the opportunity to join Rebel football after spending the last three seasons as an assistant at Florida coaching linebackers back in 2017. Coach Skipper brings a lot of experience to the field. I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, I, I think Tim's doing a great job, him and his entire staff. I mean, they've done a great job of just communicating with our players, developing the relationships you need, you know, not making it so complicated for them so they're not doing as much thinking as maybe they were in the past. And, and I think we're progressing nicely. I mean, obviously, proof's going to be in the pudding when we come into the year, but I have full confidence in him. He's a heck of a football coach. He's going to do a great job for us, you know, this year, and he'll be head coach someday, too. Skip has coaching experience working with various schools since 2001. He has his own personal success while playing on the field while he attended college at Fresno State. Skip will not only bring his skills to the team, but strives to create relationships with the players by talking to them off the field. Number one goal is just to get the guys to play with energy. Whether it's practice, we're walk through, we're in a meeting, we're out on the field, it's game day, whatever it is, I just want a ton of energy. Have guys on the field, guys on the sideline, all of us on one heartbeat of energy at one time, and then everything else will take care of itself. Coach Skipper comes from a coaching background with his father, Jim Skipper, serving as a running backs coach for the NFL's Carolina Panthers, and his brother, Kelly Skipper, the running back coach for the Buffalo Bills. The players are excited to see the new transition he will bring to the team this upcoming season. Definitely just, uh, being, just being interactive with the players and just being able to coach us and being able to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one, it's been you know, a lot easier, and on top of that, uh, just the schemes, he's making it more complex but simplistic for the players you know it's uh, complex for the other side of the ball but simplistic for us to learn so I feel like coach uh, coach Skipper has you know brought a lot of uh, great things for us as players. Saturday September 1st the boys will be taking on USC. For the Rebel Report my name is Nishan Zaragoza. UNLV football also hires Al Simmons to the program to coach the safeties. I can't wait to see what these new coaches will bring. We have a lot of excitement to look forward in this upcoming season. And now we are sending it over to David with this week's Rebel Report timeout. Rebel Report timeout. Thanks, guys. And today we have a very special guest with us, uh, head coach of men's golf here at UNLV, Dwayne Knight. Dwayne, thanks for taking some time out of your very busy schedule. <laughs> Uh, to come speak with us. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. So I know it's it's sort of crunch time right now. Regionals coming up. Uh, just tell me, what are some of your thoughts heading in? You feel good, seated number four. You're in the same region as number one team in the country, mm -hmm. Oklahoma State. Uh, how do you feel heading into this? I think we feel pretty good. Uh, a couple weeks ago at Arizona State, we had head to head with Oklahoma State and uh, Texas Tech and Arizona State, and it uh, it felt like a uh, and Oklahoma. It felt like an NCAA last round, you know, down there. And uh, we took it right to the end and ended up losing by one shot. Uh, beat Oklahoma State, beat Oklahoma, lost to Arizona State by one. But the atmosphere down there was like a national championship. So I think it uh, kind of piqued our team um, to get ready for uh, regionals and then uh, the conference, and we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, so, so losing by one, I mean, that's, that's tough. Any athlete can tell you that. So mm -hmm. you guys use that as a motivator since that happened so recently? Well, I think uh, we've been playing at a high level and been in a lot of tournaments. Uh, just the fact that we were playing those last three holes with the best teams in the country at, at that time uh, really gave us a lot of confidence that, hey, we, need, we deserve to be here uh, if we get on you know, to, the, through, to the regionals and, and hopefully to the finals, uh, we can play with these guys. So uh, we're looking forward to it. So going to Ohio State over mm -hmm. in Columbus, uh, is there any sort of pressure that comes with this uh, regional appearance? I mean, I mean, I know you guys were in Columbus a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We actually won the regional that year. Uh, I had a really, really seasoned team. This is a younger team that we're taking back there. But Shintaro Ban actually won his first tournament at, at Ohio State. So uh, he's our hottest player, obviously. He's our number one player, the only senior on the team. Uh, for him going back to there where he's had a lot of success, I think we'll, uh, that confidence will spill over the rest of the guys. Yeah, and Shintaro Ban, a fantastic uh, player. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how do you think, of, how do you feel about this team compared to teams of the past? Let's go back to 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys win the national title, mm -hmm. and a lot of people feel like this is one of the stronger group of guys that you guys have put up since then. How do you, how do you feel about your, your men? Uh, this team is not as seasoned as the one in 98. Uh, we were the number one team in the country in every poll, so when we went into the national 
finals, it was like, you know, if you don't win, it's been a bad year. And uh, fortunately, we won the national championship that year. Uh, this team's a little different. Uh, we've really come along uh, a lot toward the end of the season. We've been playing at a very high level, going into conference up at Seattle. Uh, you know, we were the favored team, and uh, it, it was good for us to play under that kind of pressure that we were supposed to win. And the guys went out and just did a, a great job. Shintaro was fantastic. You know, he won going away. Uh, but I think we're ready. You know, this is a good group. There's a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, we've, we've got a team uh, full of big ball hitters. They can hit it a long way. And on the course we're going to play at Columbus, you've got to really be a, a pretty good ball hitter and be able to have some strength. So it kind of fits our style. Uh, we like to get out there and get after it pretty good. And, uh, you know, when you have a lot of young guys and a lot of enthusiasm, um, it, you got a lot to look forward to. And we've had it from uh, day one, and, and they just keep getting better. Tell me about this course over in Columbus. How do you feel about the course, and is there any sort of advantages you think comes to play for your team playing in Ohio, at Ohio State? Well, Ohio State is uh, traditionally one of the best uh, sites they like to play the NCAA finals on and regionals on, so uh, a lot of teams tend to go back there. We, we actually schedule it every now and then in our fall schedule just to be in a tough course, you know, and up, up in the east like that. Uh, we'll probably have weather, you know, that's something we're not as used to out here. But I think we've played enough across the country in all kinds of conditions that whatever is thrown at us, I think we'll be ready to play. And, you know, you just got to do the job. You got to get the ball in the hole. And, and uh, I don't think any of the surrounding things that go on will really affect us. I think we're pretty focused on just being who we are. All right, well, Coach, congratulations on 30 straight regional appearances <laughs> and yet another Mountain West title. Uh, that's all the time we have for this interview. Back to you guys. Thank you, David, for that awesome interview. David Knight is such a nice guy. He's really calm and relaxed. But moving on to other topics, today we have hockey, soccer, and NFL to talk about. So I have with me today on our, on our panel Megan, Sarah, and Naishan. So let's start with the Golden Knights, Megan. Yesterday they got swept for nothing. What, what, what do you think is, uh, happened yesterday? Um, I think having overtime twice back to back was a lot for them and that a lot of them were fighting fatigue and just being like kind of ready to go home and everything. So hopefully they can come back tomorrow. Do you, you know, I, I was checking and I saw that out of all the games, the Knights always shot less except for the 7-0 victory over the Sharks. Um, did Coach Gallant have anything to say about that? Did he say anything about the game? Not that I remember. I know he did talk about uh, the Sharks just in general playing better than the Knights were playing and that obviously we saw that in the score. But... Um, I'm sure he's having a long conversation with them about how to switch up what they're doing. So we'll see. Do you guys think maybe the fans should be worried? Uh, personally, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, we see it a lot in hockey. We saw it in the first round with the Philadelphia Flyers and Pittsburgh Penguins, where one team did amazing one game, like 7-0, and then the next game, it was the other team winning with such high goals as well. So I don't think they should be necessarily worried. Um, we. I think everyone knew going into round two against the San Jose Sharks, both the Gold Knights and Sharks swept their uh, swept their opponents in round one. Um, so I think we were expecting to see some back and forth with two teams that play really similarly. And Sarah, since um, you started talking, um, what do you? I saw the lights. Both of the coaches got suspended. What about the lights fans? What do you think about that? Because I mean, you know, they technically don't have the next game. They won't have any. Any coach to help, help them back up. So. It's definitely interesting. Um, usually when we hear about suspensions, we see it with the players, like how we saw with the Vegas Golden Knights and San Jose Sharks. Evander Kane, he got suspended for a game. Um, but with the lights, we're seeing that their technical director and their coach might get suspended. Um, the United Soccer League still hasn't commented on it, so not a lot about the situation is known. Um, and the lights are refusing to comment on it until the United Soccer League comments on it. But um, it's definitely an interesting situation. Hopefully... You know, a part of it is in partial due to the fans. They were throwing stuff on the field. But like I said, I don't want to comment on something that we don't really know the full situation because I don't want to say anything either incorrect or wrong. Right, right. But the, how, do you think it might affect the players mentally? Oh, for sure, for sure. The coach, coaches and staff are a huge support um, for the team. Um, going back to the hockey in the nights, um, Coach Gallant is a huge 
he's a huge reason for the success of the team, one of the main reasons. Um, so if we see it with the lights, I mean, they lost um, their game on Friday and then tied um, the last game they played. So <clears throat> I think it will definitely affect the players. Um, hopefully we won't see that again happen in the future. Right. And nice shot, Shaquem Griffin. He got drafted by the Seattle Seahawks. What, what will he bring to the NFL? I think that his story is amazing and he's already caused a lot of like in regards to like popularity to him and he's like kind of just showing other people like you can legit do whatever you want to do even if you know you're not fully capable to do it but he got picked as the, f uh, the fifth round pick which is pretty amazing um, especially coming in from I believe it was Central Florida so that's pretty awesome but I think that he's very motivating like we've seen stories like Haley Dawson where they have like a prosthetic hand he's doing it legit with no hand like he's basically proving to the world like you to even to young people like you can do what you want to do like and it's his story is legit like it's like going real wide like he's getting sponsored by these big places like Nike and stuff like that he there was a story where he did pretty much 20 reps um, bench pressing 20 125 pounds with a prosthetic hand wow. a lot of people can't even do that with their own two yeah, hands yeah yeah exactly so to see someone be so willing and courage like he's not he's not doubtful you know he like is like I know I'm gonna go to the NFL and I know I'm gonna kill it and I know I'm gonna do a good job he's not letting his prosthetic not even his prosthetic hand having no hand stop him so I think his story is amazing and that it should be spread worldwide and it can legit motivate so many kids so I think he's gonna do amazing I'm gonna be rooting for him do you think this might start a trend in the NFL I definitely think it will I think that you're gonna see a lot more young kids and even grown men try to come out and do what they want to do usually when you have something happen to you like that it kind of it's like kind of like a like it opens up your your life. You know right. what I mean? You're you're afraid to do things. Right. You're afraid to go out and prove to the world what you can do. So the fact that he is doing that, and also as a minority, like it kind of comes into play as well as that. Like you can do it. Right. Like I motivate everyone to do it. Gotcha. Well, thank you, ladies, for your time. Now sending it over back to the desk. Thanks for that great discussion, guys. The UNLV Palm team is one of the school's hype teams for cheering and dancing at sports games throughout the year. Rebel Report made it to their second clinic to catch them hard at work, running miles and practicing drills. Here's what it takes to join their squad. UNLV Palm is holding clinics for new girls to see what the program is about before tryouts. This is the first year the team has held these types of clinics to prepare girls for the Palm season and get a broader group of people aware of their program that cheers at football, women's basketball, and baseball. Our main objective is to, um, is to be like the sharpest team out there. We don't compete, so we do have all this extra time to like clean it up, make sure everything's like, you know, basically perfect, but not like, we don't want to make these girls robots, but like that's our job is to make us look like the best team out there. During the clinic, girls go through what a typical practice would look like. Stretching, running, and learning dances and cheers. They also spend time getting to know the squad members, like first year returner, Ashley Nelson. I would love to see Palm just to kind of continue to grow. Like every year that the program has been in place, it's just getting better and better and we're working with more teams and we're doing different things, more events, and we're getting more people trying out and I'm just hoping that it just kind of keeps climbing, becomes more established and becomes more recognizable. Through the clinic, high school and college girls learn about the team's involvement in the community and do final preparations for the all-day tryouts held in May. So in May is going to be the tryouts and I'm going to have to come in and really show my game. Um, I'm going to practice obviously over this next month. But um, in May it's really kind of my opening to college and maybe a future team. UNLV Palm not only cheers at games throughout the year, but they also volunteer at student life events and in the community to promote UNLV athletics. Official tryouts for the team are May 12th. You have seen a couple of our reporters play basketball and tennis this season. If not, you can check, out, you can check that out on our YouTube page. But today, you'll see us play soccer. But not, it's not just any soccer game. The Royal Report went up against a really tough 10-year-old who beat cancer. As journalists, we love reporting on sports. Plus, we like to play it too. Today, we're playing soccer with a special 10-year-old.
When James turned seven, he was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. The tumor was the size of an egg. And that's where his journey started. James went through two brain surgeries, then six weeks of daily radiation, and was in active chemotherapy. After three years of this journey, James got his chemotherapy port removed this past April, and he hopes that is his last surgery. I be stage four glioblastoma brain cancer. To celebrate James getting his chemo port removed, we played his favorite sport with him, soccer. James dominated the field with his quick moves, and he played a little dirty too. Here's the situation. My team is up 3-2. James has a yellow card. Plus, he blew away his opponents with some solid burps. <laughs> well, I've been playing soccer since I was uh, three. And uh, uh, I just like kicking a ball around. Our soccer game ended with penalty kicks, and James did not disappoint his teammates. Oh, how close are you going to get? What the heck? <laughs> no! Nice job, nice job, nice job. Nice job, nice job. Nice job. Not only did James beat cancer, but he beat the odds of surviving it. And his mom was there with him along the way. And you just kind of, when you have a diagnosis of a stage four brain cancer, you do anything and everything. So he does a lot of essential oils and Reiki and all kinds of natural treatments, which I think are part of it. And his attitude. I really think his attitude is what's kept him, kept him going because he never thought he wasn't going to beat it. When your child gets diagnosed with cancer, you all of a sudden become a part of a club that you never wanted to join and you feel like you're on an island but then you find out that it really is a club a community and there's i've seen more love and support in the last three years than i've ever witnessed in my life and i never never knew that you could be so alone on an island yet surrounded so much with so many amazing people even his dog joined in on our soccer game and we all had fun playing his favorite sport with him Plus, we gave James a Las Vegas Lights FC scarf to cheer on our local professional soccer team. At the end of the game, we all received Lego bracelets to show support for James's journey. For the Rell Report, I'm Michaela Jackson. If you would like to have your own bracelet, proceeds from this bracelet go directly to the support and care and recovery for James Kish. Go to bricksofstrength.com. And that's all the time we have here on episode 9 of The Rail Report. Make sure you don't miss our final episode next week. Also, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, Rebel Report UNLV, for the latest updates. And on Instagram, at Rebel Report underscore UNLV. See you later.